Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgiveth all thine iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases, who redeemeth thy life from destruction, who crowneth thee with loving kindness and tender mercies. Welcome to this Sunday service from Calvary Baptist Church in Wamborough, New South Wales, Australia. This service will be the last one that is exclusively online. Our lockdown has ended, and so next Sunday, the 24th of October, we will have our service in person at 13 Will Wendon Close in Wamborough. All those that are in the local area, please join us for that service at the church building. We will continue to have an online service available for those who are outside the area or for those who, uh, for whatever reason, are unable or don't feel at peace about coming to the service at the church. So we, we, we still will have that online service for you. It will be a little bit abbreviated from what we've been having during these four months of lockdown, but there still will be music hymns, and there will be the message that will be identical to the one that will be preached live at the church on the Sundays, beginning next Sunday. So for many of you, we hope to see you this next Sunday, 24th of October, at the church building. We praise God for bringing us through this lockdown. But there are many other things to praise God about. And so let's lift our hearts together joyfully to Him in worship. We'll have a time of prayer, and then our message will come from Joshua chapter 24. Come thou clouds of every blessing, to my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing, call for songs of
Pray without ceasing. That's what we are commanded to do from God's Word, the Bible. Praying demonstrates our dependence upon Him, and it shows our faith in Him, because we know He is true, and He always answers according to the perfection of His will. Let's go to prayer.
Ask now of the days that are past, which were before thee, since the day that God created man upon the earth, and ask from the one side of heaven unto the other, whether there hath been any such thing as this great thing is, or hath been heard like it. Did ever people hear the voice of God speaking out of the midst of the fire, as thou hast heard and live? Or hath God essayed to go and take him a nation from the midst of another nation by temptations, by signs, and by wonders, and by war, and by a mighty hand, and by a stretched out arm, and by great terrors, according to all that the Lord your God did for you in Egypt before your eyes? Unto thee it was showed that thou mightest know that the Lord, he is God, there is none else beside him. Out of the heaven he made thee to hear his voice that he might instruct thee, and upon earth he showed thee his great fire, and thou heardest his words out of the midst of the fire. And because he loved thy fathers, therefore he chose their seed after them, and brought thee out in his sight with his mighty power out of Egypt, to drive out nations from before thee greater and mightier than thou art, to bring thee in, to give thee their land for an inheritance, as it is this day. Know therefore this day, and consider it in thine heart that the Lord, he is God, God in heaven above, and upon the earth beneath there is none else. Thou shalt keep therefore his statutes and his commandments, which I command thee this day, that it may go well with thee and with thy children after thee, and that thou mayest prolong thy days upon the earth, which the Lord thy God giveth thee forever.
Can you finish this quote? Those who fail to learn from history are doomed to repeat it. Oh, that has proved so true, hasn't it? Uh, we can see so many examples, even in our own lives, when we forget what has happened in the past, when we forget or we fail to learn from history, then we have to learn things the hard way. Israel often forgot her history, and the consequences were absolutely devastating. We've been studying through the book of Joshua, a book of the Bible that is both historic and prophetic. Historic, how important to remember history, to learn from history, because we do not want to be doomed to repeat the awful parts of it. Joshua is coming towards the end of his life. And he is preaching his final sermon to Israel. And the theme of this sermon is remember your history and then anticipate your future. Remember your history. Joshua knows that if they 
neglect to learn from history, from their own history, they will be doomed to repeat it. But there actually is a second way that you can finish that quote. Those who fail to learn from history disrespect their God. Those who fail to learn from history disrespect their God because God is good and he provides for us in many ways, just as he provided for Israel. And when we fail to remember, when we forget God's goodness, his benefits, as Psalm 103 at the beginning of our service said, then we disrespect God and we place ourselves in peril. Today's message is about remembering, remembering history. And as we come to this text of scripture, we want to ask two questions. The first question is for Israel. In Israel's history, who is the star? The second question is for you. In your history, who is the star? It ought to be God, and it surely is God, if we rem remember things correctly. The sermon in a sentence, those who fail to remember history are ungrateful toward God. Ungrateful toward God. Joshua 24, verse 1. And Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel to Shechem and called for the elders of Israel and for their heads and for the judges and for their officers. And they presented themselves before God. This is a solemn occasion. Joshua has called them to Shechem. That's not by mistake. There's nothing random about that. He has them gather at Shechem because Shechem is the very place where God promised Abraham. He showed Abraham that land and he said, this is the land I'm promising you. It was at that very spot. And so here they are hundreds of years later, some 500 and some years later, and they are at that very spot and Joshua renews with them the covenant tied to God's promise. He has gathered all of Israel, the men, the women, the children, they are all there because this pertains to every single one of them. Now in the previous chapter, chapter 23, Joshua had preached to the leaders, the leadership, but now he's preaching to everyone. Joshua is 110 years old. His time on earth is finished. These are his last words, and he pleads with God's people, remember your history. He is passionate because he already sees the seeds of forgetfulness. They have so quickly become complacent and, and compromising. They have not finished the task of, of weeding out all of the remnants that still remained in the land, remnants of people who would surely, over time, turn their hearts away from God, cause them to be forgetful, ungrateful, and to turn to false gods. Joshua brings them together. He preaches his final sermon. And he says, remember. Remember, because those who fail to remember history turn out ungrateful towards God. The form of this final sermon is a formal covenant. It was a formal covenant, a, a, a formula that was common in that day and was recognizable to the people who heard it. They knew this was a solemn occasion. The formula was called a suzerain vassal. Suzerain vassal. A suzerain was a benevolent king. A vassal was a grateful, loyal, and loving subject. God entered into a suzerain vassal covenant with Israel at Mount Sinai. That's where it began. He is the benevolent king. They are meant to be the loyal, grateful, loving subjects. This is not a covenant between equals. God is infinitely superior. 
The people have really nothing to contribute to him except for their gratefulness and their love. I want to start by taking you to Exodus chapter 20. This is where the covenant first took place and it was entered into. And I want to show you this formula for a suzerain vassal uh, covenant. A suzerain vassal covenant begins with history. It shows why the suzerain, this benevolent king, is worthy of the loyalty of his subjects. It shows his benevolence. And that's what we find in Exodus 20, verses 1 and 2. And God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God. I am the Lord your God. We talked about that last week. What a precious thing. What, what a, a sanctifying truth. The Lord our God. And he uses his proper name there too. I am the Lord your God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. He has proved his benevolence. He rescued them out of bondage. Having established that he is the benevolent ruler, and he is so powerful to be able to have rescued all these people out of slavery, he then gives his stipulations. Ten Commandments. Here is how you will demonstrate your gratitude to me, your loyalty and love to me. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. That's the first commandment. And then follows on nine additional commandments. All ten of those commandments perfectly reasonable. But sadly, God's people did not keep it. And you and I, we're not able to keep it today either, because we have sin in us. Well, it's this same formula of the covenant that is used by Joshua in this sermon to renew it at Shechem. The first question, who is the star in Israel's history? Who is the star? We're going to go through these next 13 verses, and we're going to categorize. Is the verse talking about something God did, or is it talking about something that people did, that Israel or Israel's ancestors did? It begins with Israel's ancestors. I'm reading from verse 2. And Joshua said unto all the people, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel. So same kind of uh, invocation as was given in the Ten Commandments. Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Your fathers dwelt on the other side of the flood in old time, even Terah, the father of Abraham, the father of Nacor. So this is their genealogy, who they descended from. And Abraham is part of that genealogy, of course. But notice how this verse ends. This is what they did. And they served other gods. They served other gods. So on the man side of of the the, the column, they served other gods. Abraham's descendants, Abraham himself, before he met the true and holy God, idolaters, idolaters, absolutely hopeless, had no clue what the truth was. But God in his mercy intervened, revealed himself to them, and he gave a promise to Abram, not on the basis of of Abram having done anything, but out of his own mercy and grace. Man's side, idolaters. Verse 3 now takes us to God's side. He says, I took your father Abraham from the other side of the flood. God did that. And led him throughout all the land of Canaan, and multiplied his seed, and gave him Isaac. Three things that God did in this verse. He took Abram from the other side of the river. Secondly, he brought him into Canaan, what would be the promised land, and he led him throughout that land. Abram toured around, and he saw all this wonderful land that would belong to his descendants, Israel. And thirdly, and most importantly, God multiplied his seed. Abram didn't have any children, but God gave to him Isaac as the firstborn. And then from Isaac, 
descended all these who now in Joshua's time, over two million people that have claimed the promised land, all descendants of Abraham. Verse 4 also has uh, us looking at God's side of the column. And I gave unto Isaac, Jacob, and Esau. Now that too was a miracle because Isaac's wife, Rebekah, was also barren. But, but God gave to them twins, Jacob and Esau. Esau was the firstborn, but, but God chose Jacob to be first. And then God did this. And I gave unto Esau Mount Seir to possess it. So the country of Edom, the descendants of, of Esau. But then we shift over to the man's side of the column at the end of verse 4. But Jacob and his children went down into Egypt. That's what they did. God didn't do that for them. They did that on their own. And we remember the history of Jacob. Don't want to be repeating that history. Jacob was a schemer, a liar. And here he is. He's going down to Egypt with his family. It was a good idea at the time because Egypt had food, but it turned out to be disastrous. It wasn't long before the Egyptians enslaved Jacob's family. After about 400 years of slavery, we get to verse 5 as the history continues. We're back on God's side of the ledger. I sent Moses also and Aaron. Remember, he appeared to Moses from the burning bush and called him to go and to tell Pharaoh, let my people go. And Pharaoh refused. So God did something else. And that's the next part of verse 5. And I plagued Egypt according to that which I did among them. Ten plagues. Each one of those ten plagues discrediting an Egyptian god. And by the time God got to the tenth, Pharaoh was... was very eager to let the people go. God broke him. And the end of verse 5, third thing God did. And afterward, I brought you out. God did that. Through the Passover, he delivered all of his people. It was a miracle. Verse 6 is also on God's side of the ledger. And I brought your fathers out of Egypt and ye came unto the sea, the Red Sea, and the Egyptians pursued after your fathers with chariots and horsemen unto the Red Sea. Pharaoh changed his mind. What did we do? We just let two million slaves go. We can't do that. It will ruin our economy. And so he sent his mighty army. Now you got to remember, Egypt was the reigning world empire. No country could stand up to Egypt. How could these unarmed slaves, men, women, children, cattle, the whole bit, how could they stand against Pharaoh's army? So here come the chariots, here come the army, the people are pressed up against the Red Sea, and you can just feel the panic that's setting in. Verse 7. We're on the man's side of the ledger. And when they cried unto the Lord, that's what they did, they cried out in fear, in panic. Back to God's side of the ledger. He put darkness between you and the Egyptians. They were protected. It, it didn't take God but a moment. And then he also brought them through the Red Sea and brought the sea upon them and covered them. And your eyes have seen what I have done in Egypt. And then we go back to man's side of the ledger. And ye dwelt in the wilderness a long time. Now, the journey from the Red Sea up into the Promised Land should have taken two and a half months. But it took 40 years. Why? Because Israel forgot her history. She forgot how great her God was that had brought the plagues upon Egypt, that had brought them out, that had parted the Red Sea, that had spoken to them at Mount Sinai, they so quickly forgot. They made a golden calf. They complained about the food that God was providing for them. But what 
forced them to wander in the wilderness was their un that their, their lack of faith, their faithlessness. God forgave them of the earlier sins, but when they were faithless and they refused to go into the promised land, after the, the spies came back and ten of them gave a bad report, God said, that's okay. I'll give you your way. You don't want to go in, you won't go in. This generation will wander in the wilderness until every one of you has died off, and it will be your children who will go in. That's a pretty dismal part to God to man's side of the ledger. So let's get back to God's side of the ledger. Verse 8, And I brought you into the land of the Amorites, which dwelt on the other side of Jordan, and they fought with you. Here they come. They're attacking God's people. But God's with them. And I gave them into your hand, that ye might possess their land. And so the west bank of the Jordan River was conquered by the, the people of Israel, and that was given to two and a half of the tribes. And the end of verse 8, And I destroyed them before you. God did that. The beginning of the conquest. Then there's a bit of deceit, some intrigue, through this character named Balaam. And God was there for that too. Verse 9, Then Balak, the son of Zippor, the king of Moab, so descendants of Lot. So God did not intend to destroy them, but Moab is being unfaithful and disloyal and wants to destroy Israel. And they want to do it through deceit, through a cursing. The verse says, Arose and warred against Israel and sent and called Balaam, the son of Beor, to curse you. But I would not hearken unto Balaam. God delivered them. Therefore, he blessed you still, so I delivered you out of his hand. His curse ended up being a blessing when it came out of his mouth. Then we go back to the man's side of the ledger with verse 11. And ye went over Jordan and came unto Jericho, and the men of Jericho fought against you, the Amorites, the Perizzites, and the Canaanites, and the Hittites, and the Girgashites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites. Now, this is on the man's side of the ledger, but there's no failing here. This time Israel has done the right thing. She crossed over that Jordan River, and she went right up to Jericho, and she obeyed God by marching around it just as he prescribed. The walls came tumbling down, and they took all of Jericho. They had a bit of a hiccup at Ai, but ultimately they took Ai, and then they, they went with God down to the south, and, and they had that mighty army, that coalition that they fought against, and they won. Uh, God was on their side. God, God brought the, the hail. God made the sun stand still. And then they went to, a, to the north, and it was an even larger army, innumerable, uh, more numerable than the sand on the seashore, the scripture says. And there, too, they won a great victory in a single day. That's what God did. For verse 12, I'm sorry, uh, the end of verse 11 says, And I delivered them into your hand. So they did the right thing. They marched forward, and God gave them the deliverance. Verse 12 is also God. And I sent the hornet before you, which drave them out from before you, even the two kings of the Amorites, but not with thy sword, nor with thy bow. God gave the victory, gave them the promised land. Verse 24, uh, excuse me, verse 13 is on God's side of the ledger. And I have given you a land for which you did not labor, and cities which ye built not, and ye dwell in them. Of the vineyards and oliveyards which ye planted not, do ye eat. All this prosperity they now have inherited. They have their own land. The point is clear, isn't it? If you look at the ledgers, God's side of the ledger, it's filled right up, and it's all good. God is the star. Man's side of the ledger, eh, it's not all that beautiful. There's much that's shameful about it. Idolatry, scheming, complaining, rebelling, but ultimately invading and claiming the promised land. God is the benevolent king. 
Israel must be his loyal, loving, grateful subjects. There's really no excuse not to be, after all God has done for them. Those who fail to remember history are ungrateful towards God. Once Israel was safely in the Promised Land, the seeds of forgetfulness were sown. Joshua could see it happening. They, they weren't passing God's judgment on to the small remnant that remained. They got complacent. They got comfortable. They started to compromise. And so Joshua preaches this sermon and says, you've got to remember your history, and then you must make a decision. Sadly, from our vantage point in history, we know the rest of the story. Israel did forget. And because she forgot God and was ungrateful towards God, she ended up losing the land. And even to this day, Israel does not have all of the land that was promised to her. That's history. What about your history? Who is the star in your history? You have a history. What part does God play in it? There are three points from the New Testament that God wants to play in your history, and perhaps he's already played that. If you don't have these points in your history, I urge you to turn to God so that these points will be part of your future, which in time will be history for you. The first point that God wants to be part of your history is salvation. He wants you to be saved. We read this from Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. On our side of the ledger is sin, and you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. That's our part of the ledger. We are sinners. We cannot help ourselves. We are hopeless before the holiness of God. We, we, we are in danger of judgment. That's where we are, dead in our trespasses and sins. Nothing we can do. No, no amount of good works, no uh, amount of promises that we might make can possibly atone for our sin. There's nothing that we can do for that. But we go to God's side of the ledger. Verse 4, But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace ye are saved, and hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. And so God did for us what we could not do for ourselves. He sent his only begotten Son into the world, who offered himself the sacrifice in our place. He died on the cross and paid for every sin you have ever committed, every sin you will ever commit. He atoned fully for all of it. And God accepted his sacrifice as that full payment. That's proved by the resurrection. Jesus rose from the dead the third day, and he is alive today. When you put your trust in him, then you are saved. You are no longer in peril. He delivers you out of the bondage of sin, just as he delivered Israel out of the bondage of Egypt. He makes you his child. He gives to you eternal life. And the day will come when you will enjoy all of the wonders, all of the prosperity, the blessing of his presence, which is a true promised land. Well, that's salvation. Is salvation part of your history? Are you remembering how gracious, how merciful God has been to you? The second is sanctification. Sanctification, that's Philippians 1.6. Being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus. God sends his Holy Spirit to indwell 
everyone who turns to Christ for salvation. We have the Holy Spirit to help us grow in Him and to be different from our past life. The old is gone, the new has come. This is sanctification, that we are set apart to God, that, that we live differently, we have different attitudes. We are His child. Is the process of sanctification happening in you? Are you better today than you were a year ago, five years ago, ten years ago, because the Holy Spirit is gaining more and more control of your life? That should be your history. If it's not your history, you need to ask yourself why. Have you forgotten? Have you for forgot forgotten what God has done? Are you becoming ungrateful? Then renew your covenant with Him. Renew your faith in Him, just as Israel did before Joshua on that day. And then the third is sonship, and how important this is. Sonship. Galatians 3.26, For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. Chapter 4, verse 6, And because ye are sons, God hath sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Oh, that intimacy, that warmth of relationship. And then from 1 John 3, 1, Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. The sons of God. Their security in being a son of God. Just as you can never... Uh, remove the DNA that was passed on to you from your parents so you can never remove the DNA of eternality, of holiness passed on in the rebirth. Being born again in Christ, that is security. You cannot lose that. We might shame just like we might shame our parents, but we cannot lose who we are, who we, we were born or born again to be. That security. But beyond that security, there, there is that substance. That substance of what we inherit from him. The son. Sons are heirs. And we are, are heirs to all of the wonders that are in Christ Jesus. What should this inspire? This should inspire enduring gratitude, loyalty, and love. God is our benevolent king. More than this, he is our father, our Abba father. Is sonship part of your history, part of your present, part of your future? Are you grateful? History. History is an undeniable part of who you are. It is your identity. When you neglect your history, you neglect yourself, and more than this, you are ungrateful towards God. Joshua has retold the history of Israel. This is one of ten complete retellings recorded in the Bible. Five times in Deuteronomy, once in 1 Samuel, once in Nehemiah, once in Psalms, once in Acts, and this one here in Joshua, ten times. Why is it repeated? Because we are prone to forget. Will you repeat your history? Let me give you a couple practical ways that you should do that very thing. You should do it in prayer. Intentionally take a time to remember what God has done for you. All of the things, the times he's answered prayer, the times that he has protected you, the times that he has provided for you, even if you didn't ask for it, but you see in reflection, God was there for you. Remember all of that. Remember your salvation. Remember your sanctification. Remember your sonship. And take time when you pray Maybe have a time of prayer where you don't ask God for anything, but you only thank Him for all the things that He has done for you. Be intentional about that. and Do it over and over and over again. When you are with your children, with your grandchildren, testify, 
to the good things that God has done for you. That's your history. Help them to know your history and appreciate your history. That's one thing that we can do. Another is to participate in the Lord's table. We will be serving the Lord's table at Calvary Baptist on the first Sunday of November, the 7th of November. Make every effort to be at church on that Sunday. Come prepared to participate in the Lord's table. Jesus commanded it. This do in remembrance of me. For if we fail to learn the lessons from history, we're not only doomed to repeat it, but we are demonstrating the most profane ingratitude towards our God who is unfailingly good. That's history. Next week, it's prophecy. You have a decision to make. Choose you this day whom you will serve. That's where we'll be next week. Our Father, help us to remember and may we be grateful. May we be your loyal, your loving servants. We ask this in your name. Amen. service and for glorifying God today. Just a reminder that next week we will resume our live service, that's the 24th of October, at 13 Will Wendon Close in Wombrel, Calvary Baptist Church. Hope to see many of you there for that resumption of live services. For the rest, we will have an online service next week just as normal. 
Let me pronounce the benediction. The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. Amen.